So I have the dubious task of going first tonight. I certainly drew the short straw. So as, as you said, I'm a rheumatologist and I'm also a researcher here at the University of Aberdeen. So I look after people with arthritis and I thought it'd be a little bit helpful just to have a brief chat about what the different types of arthritis are. Some of them you may have heard of, some of them not. So in there's two main types of arthritis. There's inflammatory arthritis and there's osteoarthritis. Most of you will have heard of rheumatoid arthritis. And that's a type of inflammatory arthritis. It's much more common in women than it is in men. Other types of inflammatory arthritis are those associated with psoriasis. So people who've got a skin condition called psoriasis can get inflammatory arthritis associated with that. And sometimes people can get inflammation in the spine, and that's known as ankylosing spondylitis. And all these types of arthritis have in common is that there's inflammation in the joints. Osteoarthritis is another type of arthritis, and that's different. Um, about 25% of people in Grampian will have osteoarthritis in either their hip or their knee. And that is more common as we get older. And it's more common in people who've had heavy manual jobs and who have, um, you know, used their joints well over their life. And it's a different process. It's a wear and repair process that goes on in the joints. So you get wear in the joint and your body attempts to repair that by making new bone. And as it does that, you get bony hard lumps appear. And some of you may have little bony lumps on your fingers um, as you get older. I'm not that old, but I actually think I've got a couple developing. <laughs> um, and they're called Hebriden's nodes, and that's typical of osteoarthritis. In inflammatory arthritis, though, the process is different. So the lining of the joint, which is normally thin like a bit of cling film, becomes soggy like a big soggy wet dishcloth, and lots of inflammatory cells come into that joint. Um, and, and these cause inflammation in the joint, they cause the joint to make fluid. And actually that lining of the joint sits right next to the bone and that activates cells in the bone and causes permanent damage and deformity to the bone. And that's what causes the characteristic deformities that you can see in people who've had long-standing, for example, rheumatoid arthritis. In gout, gout's another type of arthritis that you can get. And in, and in that type of arthritis, you get crystals um, uric acid crystals in your blood and they um, precipitate out into your joints so they, they, they develop in your joints and that again causes irritation and you can imagine if you've got needle shaped crystals in your joints that that would cause irritation in the joint. We have a much better understanding now of the processes driving for example inflammatory arthritis and osteoarthritis and we've got a much better understanding of the molecules and pathways that are involved. So when we talk about this big soggy wet dishcloth and all these inflammatory cells coming in there, we've got, now got drugs which can specifically target that. And so the, the um, development of biologic drugs have really revolutionized rheumatology practice. Um, some of you may have heard of these drugs. They're called anti-TNF or anti-tumor necrosis factor drugs. They were the first biologics that were developed. And they've really turned rheumatology from what was an inpatient-based specialty. We didn't have very good drugs. And we had to manage people basically by admitting them to hospital and giving them lots of steroids. And now we're largely an outpatient-based specialty because we can keep people fit and active and doing what they want to do. So really the aim of my job as a rheumatologist is to try and hit arthritis early. So it's really important when people develop signs and symptoms of inflammatory arthritis that you see your GP soon and that you get referred into us and so that we can hit it hard and early with good drugs and prevent joint damage. But arthritis isn't just about the joints. And so as a rheumatologist, I think of myself as a medical doctor, I'm a physician, and we're very much concerned about the patient attached to the joints. Um, William Hebriden was, is commonly referred to as the father of, he, of rheumatology, and he was born in 1710. And 
He was one of the first to recognise the importance of holistic care for people with arthritis. And he used to recommend that his patients go to take the waters in Buxton, the spa waters. And that wasn't because he actually thought that the spa waters did any good for their arthritis per se. But he said that the change of routine, respite from work, domestic worries and overindulgence was probably the most important thing. So he recognised the importance of holistic care for people with arthritis. And also inflammatory arthritis doesn't just affect the joints. So it's not just about having inflammation in the joints. That inflammation is there throughout the body. And that increases the risk of things like heart disease and stroke. And also living with a chronic condition is really challenging. Um, and people have to learn to manage that and to cope with life. It has significant impact in terms of managing pain, in terms of mental health and well-being, in terms of jobs, and in terms of financial impact as well. So what you're going to hear about tonight from um, the speakers who follow on from me is the importance of physical activity in both inflammatory arthritis and osteoarthritis in terms of keeping your heart fit and healthy and preventing, trying to reduce that risk of heart disease and stroke. And it's also really important that patients are supported um, to manage their arthritis well. And um, the team from Versus Arthritis are going to talk a little bit about the support that they offer for that. Before I sign off, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the research that um, we're doing here in Aberdeen around arthritis. And I think it's important to say at the start that patients are, have played a really integral part in that, in both in telling us what the real problems are and, and the asking the right questions and also helping in terms of um, delivering the research. So we hold two national registries here in Aberdeen, one for psoriatic arthritis, which is the arthritis associated with psoriasis, and one for ankylosing spondylitis as well. And these registries are really important because we recruit patients who are on treatments for these types of arthritis or starting new treatments. And we've gained really important information about the safety of, of some of the drugs I've talked about, the biologic drugs. And it also helps us to answer new questions. So as someone who was born and brought up in the Highlands, I'm acutely aware of the problems some of our patients face um, accessing healthcare services. And some people have huge distances to travel. So we looked at the ankylosing spondylitis register to see whether there were any differences between people who lived rurally and people who lived in urban areas. And we found that those who live in rural areas have significantly more problems with work than those living in urban areas. Now, the registry doesn't tell us the answer why, but we've gone on to do some further interview studies, which we're doing at the moment, to try and understand that. And that's really important because that helps us to develop interventions and things that we can do to help people. And, and Maureen will talk a little bit more about work later. We've also got PacFind, and I see one of my fellow investigators Professor Lecoq sitting over there. So PacFind um, is a versus arthritis funded program grant, 1.1 million pounds over five years. And that's help us design and deliver better services for people with fibromyalgia, which is a chronic pain syndrome. And again, we're utilizing the data linkage. So everybody in Scotland um, has data collected about them at a national level. It's all anonymous, but we can use that to learn about, um, about people's journeys through the healthcare system. And, and, and so we're going to design and deliver better services for people with fibromyalgia. I'm also doing the same in people with rare rheumatic disease. So whilst that affects only a few people, um, these people have really complex illnesses. And again, they have a very scattered journey through the healthcare system. We're also doing some work on early knee osteoarthritis. I mentioned osteoarthritis affects about 25% of people in Grampian. And Fresco, a name which I'm very proud of, <laughs> which is looking at um, early knee osteoarthritis and trying to ultimately help us develop some treatments 
for knee osteoarthritis, because currently there aren't any. And lastly, we've got Walk With Ease, which Catherine Martin may talk a little bit more about, and that's about how we can encourage people with arthritis um, in terms of physical activity. So I think I probably have talked enough now. I think my 10 minutes is up. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Catherine Martin, who's going to talk a little bit more about the importance of physical activity. Thank you. Hello. Hi there. Good evening. Um, it's nice to see so many folks out there. And before I begin, I just want to say that if I um, cough, um, it, it's just because I am recovering from whooping cough. Um, so don't be alarmed. I'll be all right. But hopefully I'll make it through um, all right without any issues. Um, I'm not infectious, just so you know. <laughs> um, so I think one of the important things um, for me was to be in front of you all tonight because, as you can see by so many people in the room, arthritis, although isn't necessarily the sexiest topic on the block, it is really important to so many people because um, there are a number of people living with arthritis, but also many people will at least know at least one other person, um, either in their family or a friend group um, that, that is living with arthritis. And so um, tonight I want to touch upon the importance of self-management. So as Rosemary mentioned, um, there are a number of different forms of, of arthritis and we are really um, fortunate to have a wonderful rheumatology clinic here, really wonderful um, physicians and consultants who take care of many, many people. Um, but there's a lot that we can do um, within our control, um, especially since arthritis uh, can be, I suppose, managing, it can be a daunting task, but we can take control of those symptoms that are so familiar to many people, including pain, fatigue, um, and stiffness that goes along with these conditions. Um, so in terms of self-managing, many of you might be familiar, and so it goes without saying, um, to first maybe be a bit organized um, in your approach. Um, individuals with uh, various forms of inflammatory arthritis, even osteoarthritis, um, and Rosemary mentioned fibromyalgia, can often um, go into flares. Um, there's things that set them off. Um, and so keeping a diary of those types of um, symptoms, pain levels, um, medication use, your daily activity, um, trying to, to find some patterns um, or even just have it as a tool to be able to bring back to your GP or to your consultant um, is a nice way to have that conversation at, at the first offset. Um, it also goes without saying that eating a healthy diet is really good to maintain a healthy weight because we know individuals with arthritis tend to have pain, maybe tend to become a bit inactive, sedentary, um, and that can impact on those symptoms. Carrying extra weight impacts on inflammation as well um, throughout your body, um, which contributes again to that, that pain cycle um, into the condition. Um, making sure to get good sleep is also very important. So um, these, are, these are things that um, you probably have heard about in the past, but really making sure that you fall asleep and stay asleep is important. So um, just thinking about that. But I want to focus a bit more on the physical activity um, element because physical activity um, goes without saying um, that it, it is so important. It's something that we talk about all of the time. Um, in terms of managing your arthritis, but also your health. Um, it's important to keep muscles strong and bones strong um, so that those painful joints are supportive well um, and that you have really good range of motion um, and you're able to, again, keep your sleep, boost your mood um, and your sense of well-being so that you can keep, keep going forward. Um, Rosemary mentioned a little bit about um, physical activity and exercise is being important, especially for inflammatory arthritis. And we want to make sure um, that folks who have rheumatoid arthritis, gout, lupus, or psoriatic arthritis, even osteoarthritis, maintaining their physical activity um, because there's a, there's a real increased risk of developing heart disease with these conditions. And so physical activity um, can, can be um, an important um, uh, solution to that. So the link to cardiovascular health and physical activity has been known for quite some time. So this harks back to Professor Jerry Morris um, uh, in London, who had been doing some research around um, bus conductors um, and drivers and noted that there was an increased risk of heart disease among those who were the bus drivers, and they were sedentary for most of their, their day. And he also was noting that the individuals 
who were sorry, conductors um, had less risk of cardiovascular disease. And so this is something that we've known since the 1950s. It's really important, and that risk of cardiovascular disease and physical activity um, has, has been there for some time. Um, and so the, the actual guidelines for physical activity um, are, have been set, um, and they are consistent in many of the, the Western um, uh, countries, Canada, the United Kingdom, the United States, are very, very similar. And those, um, those actual guidelines hold still for individuals with um, arthritis. And so uh, many of you might be aware you need to get 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity in your week, which seems quite quite a lot, doesn't it, to try and get 150 minutes in. That's two and a half hours of moderate to vigorous activity. That's getting your heart rate up. That's making sure that you're um, doing some activity that maybe causes you to be a little bit breathy um, and, and, and sort of maybe cause a sweat. Um, there was a study done in Northwestern um, with a Dorothy Dunlop's group, and she was interested in asking the question, because a lot of people do feel 150 minutes is, is quite a lot. It's daunting. If you've got pain, you might be fatigued with your arthritis. She wanted to know what is the minimum amount of activity that you could or should encourage individuals with arthritis to actually get. Um, in, in sort of the first instance. And she looked and followed individuals up for two year period and found that individuals who engaged in 45 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity, so a nice brisk walk, actually maintained their function over that two year period or improved. Um, and so that is heartening to think about. So if you're sort of sitting there thinking, I should be a little bit more active. I know I need to be active. I don't know where to start. I'm a little bit afraid that I might cause injury to myself or I might actually um, increase my pain levels. Starting and setting a goal of 45 minutes in the first instance with some nice brisk walking is one way to sort of ease yourself back into that physical activity and try to meet that 45 minute goal, at least in the offset, and then try and build up and increase your activity levels. Um, in some research I did a little while ago, um, there were a group of individuals wearing accelerometers. We were able to nicely look at the level of physical activity of those moderate to vigorous physical activity minutes that people achieve in a day. And older adults, so this wasn't necessarily in a group of people who have arthritis, but amongst older adults and even middle-aged individuals, the moderate to vigorous physical activity minutes actually peaked sort of sometime mid-morning. So we get up in the morning, we get going, and those number of minutes actually peak mid-morning. And then the course of the day, they just do a steady, slow decline. So if that resonates with you, one way to get your moderate to, visit, um, moderate to vigorous physical activity minutes in is maybe to think about times in your day where you're most sedentary, maybe after dinner, um, after your tea at night, and go for a walk around the block and get that activity in. Other research has shown that you don't have to accumulate 150 minutes all in one go. You don't even have to do it in 30 minute blocks. You can do it in 10 minute chunks throughout the week. As long as that main, you're maintaining that brisk walk or that activity that causes you to be breathy and a bit, bit sweaty. Um, and it's important to remember that when you're engaging in physical activity that you need to balance this with rest. Um, don't go hard all at once. Start slow, gradual, engage in activity that you enjoy that brings you pleasure and happiness. And be thinking about ways in which you can um, get that um, in, in. And if you're um, sore after two hours after ending your physical activity, so think about this as a two hour rule. If after two hours, you're still sore, that means you overdid it. So next time, calm, calm down, do a little less activity, vary your duration or the type of activity that you're engaging with. So um, I just want to um, leave with a story um, uh, about a, a, a famous, very famous painter you might have heard about, Pierre-Auguste Renoir. Um, and he was... Um, very famous for scenes like Two Girls at a Piano and Dance at Bougival. 
Um, but you may recognize his name or his paintings, but many of you may not have known that he um, actually lived with rheumatoid arthritis. So this is back in the turn of the, well, the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, biologic therapy wasn't available. Um, and as he progressed and his disease progressed, he also had ankylosis um, uh, of the spine and his elbow um, and his hands, um, obviously with the rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and so he was in constant pain and yet he continued to paint. And he found ways to engage with this passion. Um, he found ways to make adaptations. So when he couldn't walk any further to get to the locations of scenes that he wanted to paint, they would carry him in modified wheelchairs to get to that location. Um, he would rely on his family and friends to do that. Um, he created a very interesting um, cylinder, um, vertical and horizontal cil cylinder um, sort of device that would move the canvas in ways that would be able to, he'd be able to access it with his hands. Um, when he couldn't grip his paintbrushes any longer, he would have them tied to his hands in a way that he would be able to continue to paint. He continued to make these adaptations. Research has shown that individuals living with arthritis who are able to engage in positive, active coping skills, like what uh, I described with what Renoir, actually do better in terms of their physical and their mental health. Um, and so it's important to be thinking about this in terms of what activities are you passionate about beyond those obligatory you know, activities of getting up in the morning, getting dressed, doing self-care, or the ones that you're committed to, like going to work, um, which Maureen will talk about, um, maybe caring for family members. Um, what are the things that you like to do that are sort of those discretionary leisure time activities? What, what are ways that you can actually continue to engage in those? Maybe you may need to make adaptations or you may need to actually seek help from a, a family member or a friend. Um, what ways can you, you know, dance um, in a way that doesn't cause you pain? So be looking for those opportunities and, and ways in which you can live well with arthritis. Um, and the folks here from Versus Arthritis um, are going to talk a little bit more about how the charity might be able to enable you to do that. So thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, my name is Alan McGinley, and um, if anybody read the publicity beforehand, you'll know that it's not the scheduled speakers, myself and Maureen, were kind of drafted in late. So we're kind of slightly thinking in our feet, although we do have some notes prepared. Um, and I'm going to take things in a slightly different direction um, from where we were a minute ago um, and take us to um, kind of policy level uh, and then maybe try and get us back into the kind of more practical um, engagement um, that diverse arthritis does. Uh, and the reason I want to do that is I want to talk about numbers, um, impact, um, traction of um, the issue of arthritis and musculoskeletal conditions, recognition at government level, how you achieve change, uh, and then what we do ourselves to, to help that along the road. Um, we have 1.8 million people in Scotland with a, a musculoskeletal condition, uh, estimated 900,000 adults with back pain, uh, almost uh, 556,000 uh, with severe back pain. Uh, nearly 700,000 people in Scotland over 45 with osteoarthritis of the hip uh, or the knee and approximately 37,000 with rheumatoid arthritis. So a lot of numbers, big numbers, and I think it's um, something they'll come back to in terms of um, uh, where we are in terms of the recognition uh, of the issue. In terms of impact, um, painful musculoskeletal conditions are the largest single cause of years lived with disability and the third largest cause of disability adjusted life years. That means basically um, healthy life years. You lose more healthy life years as a result of most skeletal conditions uh, than most other conditions, which is pretty significant if you want to lead a healthy life and if government wants to try and support that. Uh, musculoskeletal conditions are also more prevalent in deprived areas. So in, if we want to address health inequalities, this is a uh, particularly kind of uh, pertinent area. Um, it costs the NHS something like 353 million pounds a year in Scotland um, to deal with musculoskeletal conditions. It's in the top 10. Um, probably diabetes and cancer are at the top, uh, but it's, you know, it's in there. Uh, but I think it doesn't have the uh, recognition. Uh, and uh, Maureen will tell you more maybe about the kind of impact uh, on the workforce, on the economy, uh, on why um, we aren't really kind of uh, supporting people properly to stay in work or to get into work uh, because of their arthritis. 
Um, however, I think this kind of story I want to kind of try and tell in the few minutes I've got is, um, is that we don't really um, have the recognition at a government level, uh, an NHS level, uh, a local authority level, a public health level, a health and social care partnership level uh, of arthritis and musculoskeletal conditions. And I kind of want to try and see, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about diabetes for a minute, um, partly because there's a useful exemplar there. Um, I worked for 13 years with Diabetes UK as our policy public affairs manager in Scotland. And I started in 2001, and that year we had um, the national, well, the Scottish Diabetes Framework. It was the first in the UK, um, it was also one of the first in the world. It had the first national retinopathy screening programme, a big investment in that. Um, it was an all singing, all dancing. It was a big clinical document. It had lots of kind of big words, clinical words. It had some patient involvement uh, in it, um, but it was a kind of big start. Um, then we had another version of that in 2003-04. Then in 2010, we had a third iteration. And uh, don't worry, um, you okay? Okay, right, take a drink. Um, we had a third iteration in 2010. Uh, and I think now um, diabetes is now firmly embedded as a kind of de facto um, health priority uh, across Scotland, particularly a public health priority. Now, I think the thing that drove that was, was there's several things. I think one is um, data. Uh, when we started in 2001, there's a thing called the Scottish Diabetes Survey. It was a gathering of data from across health boards in Scotland. It was led by clinicians. Uh, there's a lot of investment in it, a lot of kind of personal investment of time by those clinicians as a voluntary effort. Um, and that helped government to see that, you know, what the outcomes were, what the measures were that needed to be made. Um, and I think that, you know, the, every year that, that came out, or every 18 months, or every two years it came out, it kind of, it kind of successively um, encouraged uh, NHS government to put uh, more effort into addressing um, the issues. And so we had, um, we had data, and I think that's something we have lacked with um, arthritis, with musculoskeletal conditions, um, and I think it's something we are beginning to address more, and I think it's the thing that will drive change. It may sound very dry, but it's actually really necessary. We had leadership, we had people um, at clinical level, we had patients, uh, we had charities, uh, and we had partnership, which uh, brought those together uh, around things like the Scottish Diabetes um, National Working Group, uh, which stayed in place for a long time and kept that, that agenda going. Um, and I think the kind of, um, the way we had to interfere is with data plus doom. We also managed to kind of get a sense that this was an impending health crisis within Scotland. And if anybody turns on the news last week or probably next week, you'll see diabetes, you'll see the problems, you'll see the fact that, you know, type 2 diabetes is costing a, a, literally an arm and a leg um, for um, the Scottish public and for the NHS. And uh, the government is finally starting to do something about that. And I think, although that's a big trajectory um, in terms of, uh, you know, when we started in 2001, where we are now with diabetes, to some extent, arthritis, MSK, has to kind of try and follow some of that. And I think that's what Versa Arthritis is starting to do, um, along with our partners, uh, our research partners, our partners across other third sector organisations like the Health and Social Care Alliance, uh, to try and make sure that there is a kind of, a, you know, a, a bigger effort, a bigger offer, a bigger understanding, a sense that this also is a public health crisis. Um, if you don't treat diabetes, if you don't treat, sorry, this is, I'm getting back to my my old job, um, 2001. Um, if you don't treat and uh, deal with uh, musculoskeletal conditions, um, and we do know, for, for, for example, that if you treat musculoskeletal conditions, then you actually do help the other conditions. Most people live with multiple conditions nowadays. Uh, you start with that one, then other things like diabetes will themselves improve, or the outcomes will improve. So we know that's the case. So I think that's it. So data, leadership, um, we've got good advocates for the conditions, partnership, uh, and recognising the scale of the problem. Uh, and what is uh, Versa Arthritis doing? Well, one of the things we are doing, we're leading on the data work. Um, one of my colleagues, James O'Malley, has uh, convened some quite big meetings with uh, National Services Scotland and um, the burden of disease team and the people that are in public health in Scotland to try and embed um, thinking around, you know, we need more and better data around uh, arthritis and MSK. And that's really paying off. And I think over the next few years, I think we're going to see some big changes there and some uh, real improvements. Uh, we're pushing in policy. We're, last year, um, the government published a number of documents around uh, public health, around things like uh, um, healthy weight uh, and uh, diet and physical activity. And um, we did a lot of work trying to make sure that arthritis MSK was in there uh, with absolutely no dividends at all. There's no mention at all in any document about arthritis or MSK. 
big disappointment to us. But since then, we've worked with civil servants, we've worked with ministers, um, uh, we're beginning to work with the uh, special advisors, and we're getting a lot more traction in that area. And we really do hope um, that you know, come to the you know, when the new Scottish public health body. Uh, comes into being in April next year, I think it is now, uh, that Arthritis MSK is a, a part of its kind of its thinking. Uh, we're embedding our work in communities. One of the things we do really well in Scotland, uh, and it's a legacy from the, uh, the charity I joined a few years back, uh, Arthritis Care, is we work within communities. Um, we work at a local level. We work with people with arthritis in their groups uh, or indeed in the clinics. Um, so, for example, in Aberdeen, uh, our Joint Potential Plus, which is a young person's project, uh, works in the rheumatology clinics or the kind of transition clinics uh, with under 25s and uh, we have a member of staff who's actually a kind of unpaid member of staff of NHS Grampian who works uh, in those clinics and helps uh, the young people to um, identify both their social problems and then to relate those to their clinical issues and then trying to get a more rounded service and I think that's a uh, that's a huge bit. Of, and I mean, it's worth saying also that that started in Aberdeen and it's now been picked up in Glasgow, Forth Valley, uh, Fife and elsewhere. So these things kind of spread once people see how um, effective they can be. Um, and I think, um, you know, and, and, and as I say, we, we're, we're embedding ourselves in communities. We're doing a lot of work at a local level uh, from Orkney down to um, Stranraer, um, just uh, working with people, uh, seeing what they want and then seeing how we can get ministers or local authorities or local health posts to listen. Uh, and indeed, the other thing we do very, very well in Scotland, better than elsewhere in the UK, is we do a lot of work around work around employment, around um, dealing with people who are having struggles with uh, staying in work or getting into work. Um, and Maureen is very much our kind of go-to person around that. And I think she'll probably pick up on some of that uh, when she speaks. So I'm going to leave it. I was going to try and tell a story. That I heard last week from one of my colleagues uh, from the Young People's Project that um, there's a, they took a group of young people and volunteers to Edinburgh Zoo um, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was. And they met a penguin who has arthritis um, and um, he's, um, he basically gets his anti-inflammatories in his fish. Um, and I think, um, and we're really keen, I mean, this is one of the things, I mean, I, I used to work in public affairs, so I do know the value of a good case study. And, um, and I think we really do want to get that pen going on board. Uh, so this time next year, do look out. Uh, you never know, we're going to try and name him, hopefully. Um, so I'll pass over to Maureen now, okay? I'm delighted to see so many people here and trying to follow on from the three speakers. So, as I say, I'm Maureen, Maureen McAllister. I manage the Working Well with Arthritis Service. That covers the whole of Scotland. Um, I'm going to kind of list all the kind of services that we actually offer in Scotland, not only the employment service, but we work with age 10-year-old upwards. And we've got a kind of groups of different types of services. It might be something that people would want to engage with. And volunteers are key to a lot of the work that we do because we have, we're a small team of staff. We're based throughout Scotland, we're staff based in Orkney, down to Duns in the Borders, and we've got an office based in Glasgow. And we do try to offer and cover as much as we can, but without the volunteers, we wouldn't be able to do as much. So, as I say, we, we work with age 10-year-old upwards and we have got a young people and family service. That's for 10 to 25-year-old. We have 16 workshops or weekends every year and we have a team of volunteers of young people that help us with that. In fact, one of our volunteers, Sam, is here tonight and has been working with us um, on that for several years. We also have um, self-management programs. So we have Living Well with Arthritis and we do a range of things. So we've got branches, we've got Aberdeen branch, we've got branches throughout Scotland. And these are run by people with arthritis, for people with arthritis. We also have groups that can be walking groups, Tai Chi groups, whatever, they come together because of some sort of activity that they're doing. And if some groups that come together really just because they want to find something to do together and we can help and support them to develop that throughout, um, throughout the Scotland we do that. Um, we also offer free self-management courses. So self, our self-management modules have been designed around the person with arthritis. We train up volunteers who are living with a long-term condition and then they go through our SVQ train the trainer and they're able to deliver these self-management programs with our support to people with arthritis or any other long-term condition. 
Um, there's, we also have a service in Nairn for people who are maybe in homes or, or are unable to get out of the house. And we do offer, again, self-management programme for them within the home. So that's kind of some of the services that we actually offer. I manage the employability service. And as part of that, it's offering support to people to stay in work or get back into work. I do partnerships with the usually the occupational therapy team or physiotherapy team within the NHS. They're working with people and supporting people and maybe they will quite often need a bit extra support. They'll refer them to myself or my colleagues and we'll be able to signpost people and find out what support they actually really need. So part of that is, is actually establishing whether they're getting the support through the healthcare service, whether it's pain management courses they need to go on, whether they're managing their condition well and then they can get access to any of the support networks that we have. Often when I'm talking to people that actually don't appreciate that they're protected under the Quality Act, they don't realise their rights in the workplace and they're often falling out of work due to that lack of understanding and lack of support. So we work quite closely with Department of Work and Pensions to raise awareness of this. We've actually done a piece of campaign work looking at access to work. Now, access to work is a DWP support service for people in work to help them stay there. So it can offer like taxis to and from work, um, specialist equipment, ergonomic seating, whatever somebody might need to help them remain in the workplace. Um, that, that can be taken with them from wherever, wherever they work. And as long as somebody's working 16 hours a week or more and living with a long-term condition, then they can access this service. We found that this service for people with arthritis is actually not really um, well known. We found that almost 60% of people with arthritis don't know about the service. So they're, as I say, they're not taking advantage and asserting their rights and then they're falling out of work. When we were doing some research in that area, we established that 95% of people with arthritis who are in work say that they daily live with pain in the workplace. So you can imagine when you're, you're trying to manage work, living your life and con controlling your condition and getting no support from whether it's your employer or, or external bodies. So we try to raise awareness within um, government departments and, as I say, DWP, just to make sure that people with arthritis, um, the conditions recognised and the issues are recognised, and that can be through our campaign reports. We also, um, Alan was just talking about case studies, um, the penguin being the case study, but anybody with arthritis who have have had some issues, we will raise awareness through their case studies. They will quite often tell us that their stories. Um, I did a piece of research recently um, with Glasgow University and a lot of people came to us and told us how difficult they found work and their case studies. We were then able to present that to Scottish Parliament to, to showcase these are the issues that people are talking to us about. Again, in June, we're host, hosting another event to do that, to get people to come and share their stories. And some people work quite successfully and quite well and can tell us about the support they're getting and others can learn from that. And that peer support can help people feel confident to make, um, make decisions in the workplace, whether to stay in the workplace or move to another job or to find support to get back into, into work. The research that that I was talking about here is our campaign report. We're actually just going to launch the rest of it soon. But 86% say they live with fatigue and try to work with fatigue. So again, that really highlights the difficulties that the invisibility of this condition does. Quite often, people think you look well and they don't feel as if they, they are due what they think other people who have more obvious conditions have. So um, we try and talk to them about their rights in, in the workplace, but also understanding the Equality Act and where to find that service. And we tie it in with finding local services. So within Grampian and with Aber within Aberdeen, if I'm working with somebody, I'll find where they are locally, looking at what Citizens Advice offer or what DWP offer or what local charities offer and to see what there is locally for them to get access to. There's no point in us trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, we also work with the new Social Security Scotland, so disability benefits like PIP, 
disability allowance and attendance allowance. There's a review of those devolved benefits. And over the next couple of years, Scotland will take over ownership and management of those benefits. So we're at the table raising awareness of the benefits and the need for a robust and, and supportive network to help people get their benefits they're entitled to and stay on benefits. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, we had one of our volunteers today hugely and enough we couldn't say enough about the volunteers and the support that they give us uh, if anybody here today wants to know more about what we do or get involved i've got some leaflets and booklets over at the the window over there but certainly you can get in touch we've got a member of staff based in grampian it's just unfortunate he couldn't be here tonight but philip would be quite happy to support anybody that who wants to take any of these um, pieces of information forward and get in touch with us thank you Thank <laughs> you.